Good morning and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, this is Mitchell Warren from AVAC, and sorry that we are getting a little later start, but a lot of people just joining. Um, and, uh, but delighted to welcome you here to a webinar uh, in partnership with the Treat and Action Group, a longtime AVAC partner, um, and, and really been at the forefront uh, of uh, research translation, research engagement, and research advocacy uh, now for TAG for 25 years and AVAC for 22 years. And delighted to welcome everybody here um, to, to this webinar and, and really to um, highlight uh, that, that you'll hear in just a moment um, a new report from the Treatment Action Group. And Jeremiah Johnson from TAG is going to present that, and I'll introduce him in just a moment. But first I wanted to get through a little bit of quick logistics. Um, this call is in Global Mute so that we can keep the line clear uh, as we are recording for, um, uh, to post this afterwards. Um, but we do want this to be an interactive conversation. So we're going to have a couple of presentations and, and discussions um, over the next half hour or so. Um, but then we will go into hopefully uh, uh, Q&A and discussion as quickly as we can. Um, throughout the presentations, you are welcome to enter any questions into the chat feature in the ReadyTalk box if you're on ReadyTalk online or you can email us at avac at avac.org um, at any point during the, the presentations. And then as we do the Q&A and discussion, I'll give some instructions on how to get off of mute to be able to ask questions directly. Um, the, the plan for today is um, I will introduce Jeremiah in a moment, and, and, and he'll provide um, a, a really thorough review of a recent report that TAG just issued. Um, we'll then have um, Stacey Hanna from AVAC, a colleague of mine, um, here who leads all of the good participatory practice work um, to, to put that in context. And then Deborah Dinell De from uh, the Fred Hutch and the HIV Prevention Trials Network um, will, will give some perspective as well, and then we'll open it up for Q&A. Um, so that's kind of the logistics and run of show. And before I turn it over to Jeremiah, I did just want to say that, that why this call for us is so exciting, both as AVAC and as TAG. And, and, and when one looks back over the last um, decade or more of prevention research, uh, we, we've all been through um, enormous ups and downs, uh, um, setbacks and excitements. And when I think particularly um, related to pre-exposure prophylaxis and um, the early controversies now 13 years ago in those PrEP trials, which led to a number of things, not least of which were uh, the good participatory practice guidelines uh, um, that you'll hear Stacy describe, and, and then of course eventually leading to um, oral PrEP approved uh, with TDFFTC as um, one of the newest biomedical prevention options available. So we've all seen this transition from trial controversy into uh, licensed product and now into oral PrEP programs rolling out. And these are, as many of us have talked about over the years, the complexities that we longed for. How do you integrate and take advantage of new prevention options in the context of the still urgent need to develop future biomedical interventions? And that's really at the heart of this conversation, uh, the heart of, of the, the report that you'll hear about in just a moment from, from Jeremiah at TAG. Um, there have been a lot of meetings and consultations and reports related to um, uh, the idea of how to integrate a new intervention into prevention trials. That has been discussed uh, in many different places. At the same time, um, uh, we have this exciting moment where oral PrEP is being rolled out, and, and that's really uh, where this work comes, comes into to focus. So um, again, delighted to have everybody here, and, and most of all, really delighted to be in partnership with TAG and giving a chance for Jeremiah to uh, present on behalf of a number of partners and collaborators at the Treatment Action Group a recent report related to HIV prevention research in the era of oral PrEP and how to think about this um, in uh, in, in new and exciting ways and, and in a very uh, um, interactive way as well. Um, that report is online and available at the TAG website, um, and I know it was in a link in the, in the webinar details, and, and uh, we can make sure that's in the follow-up as well for those who haven't read it. Um, but without further ado, I want to introduce Jeremiah, who's been at TAG for a number of years and now is their community education coordinator and is, is also just a remarkable um, advocate, uh, not just around um, community engagement, but really around uh, research, around treatment, and around prevention. And really delighted, Jeremiah, to welcome you here um, and to turn this over to you. Thank you so much, Mitchell. Um, can you hear me? I can, perfectly. Okay, good. 
Um, so uh, I'm going to try and cover a complex uh, paper uh, with a lot of content as quickly as possible so we can get to Stacy and Deborah and uh, questions. But uh, really appreciate AVAC um, suggesting this webinar and, and the opportunity to partner today. Um, the admiration is uh, mutual, Mitchell, for sure. Um, and so uh, I'm going to dive into our paper, The Implications of TDF-FTC Pre-Exposure Prophylaxis for Biomedical Prevention Trials. Um, next slide, please. Briefly, I want to acknowledge my co-authors on this paper, Richard Jeffries and Tim Horn, who are also here at TAG. Uh, we'd like to thank AIDS Funds for providing the funding um, that allowed us to do this work. And again, thank you to AVAC. Next slide, please. And in case you don't know about who we are, um, we are an independent activist and community-based research and policy think tank fighting for better treatment, prevention of vaccine, and a cure for HIV. TB, and Hepatitis C. Um, and you can visit our website there to find out more. We're celebrating 25 years this year. Next slide, please. So, um, you know, as Mitchell was referring to, this is sort of a welcome problem, actually, to, to have. You know, we have um, a highly efficacious um, HIV prevention option for HIV-negative individuals these days, um, and it's exciting to watch PrEP uh, roll out in different contexts and in different populations over time. Um, a lot of effective advocacy has really brought us to this point. But it does leave those of us who um, work from a, a community perspective on, um, you know, HIV prevention research advocacy, um, walking a bit of an ethical tightrope. Uh, on the one hand, we know that while PrEP is fantastic, PrEP isn't enough. We need more tools. We need a vaccine. Uh, we need better options for different populations. We need uh, better options for, for women. Um, and so we have a, a bit of an ethical obligation to continue to research different HIV prevention modalities and, uh, and to prove that they are efficacious. Um, but at the same time, we have to balance that against the fact that in these trials that we conduct, that we have obligations to minimize risk for trial participants. Um, and historically, we've always, um, you know, done that by offering uh, the, the state-of-the-art, the best um, uh, standard of HIV prevention available. Um, and so in this sense, the good news is, is that PrEP is highly effective, and so that's, that's fantastic news. But the, the sort of, you know, paradoxically bad news for those of us working on research is that Truvada PrEP is so efficacious that if all trial participants were to use it consistently as part of a background prevention package, evaluating whether a new experimental intervention has any significant effect, effect on HIV risk would become extremely challenging or perhaps impossible. So that leaves us with a real question here. What should be the standards for providing PrEP to clinical participants? Next slide, please. So uh, in order to try and develop some recommendations around this, we sought out two sources of information. One, we conducted a literature review, and then we developed a questionnaire that we sent out to community advocates to get their take on um, what should be the standards moving forward. Next slide, please. So I'm going to go over a few key findings from the literature review and then the questionnaire and then give you some of our recommendations that we came up with. So in the literature review, our primary focus was to look at literature addressing uh, TDF-FTC prep in biomedical clinical trials and what are some of the guidelines and what are some of the practices that we're seeing for providing prep in these trials. We uh, found three existing sets of guidelines on prevention services for trial participants. Um, the first set comes from uh, UNAIDS and WHO, originally published in 2007 and updated in 2012. The second comes from the HIV Prevention Trials Network Ethics Guideline for Research, which was published in 2009 um, and co-authored by Jeremy Sugarman, who um, also was very, additional publications from him were very informative in our recommendations. And then, of course, as Mitchell already talked about, the Good Participatory Practice Guidelines, 
developed by UNAIDS and AVAC in 2011 that we'll hear more from Stacy uh, shortly. Next slide, please. And looking at these guidelines, uh, you know, we see that there's a lot of great advice in all of them, a lot of, uh, uh, of very important suggestions, but no clear standard necessarily. However, we did highlight, you know, for our recommendations that we came up with, um, a number of guiding principles uh, from each of the guidelines that, that carried uh, some weight for us. So uh, in the UNAIDS WHO guidelines, they advise that counseling and access to all state-of-the-art HIV risk reduction methods is really the direction that we should be going. So really putting preference on as much access to PrEP as, as possible would seemingly uh, be the, uh, the recommendation coming out of there. But then looking at the HPTN guidelines, um, it looks a little bit more at the context. So it's also important to, to understand what are locally sustainable prevention services for trial participants after the trial ends? If PrEP is not approved in that country, what effect does that have on trial participants when we're providing them with something that might not be sustainable for them in the long run? And so we need to consider that. It also brings up the concept of undue inducement, this notion that if we're providing a prevention option that isn't available locally, are we somehow overly incentivizing participa participation in the trial and shifting the real balance of power between participants and researchers, something we're always trying to avoid? Um, so that's another consideration. Something coming out of both the HPTN and AVAC guidelines uh, is that consultations with key stakeholders, including community members, is key. And of course, the GPP guidelines go very in-depth into this and seems to be essential for whatever decisions are made about um, PrEP and uh, provision and trials. This wasn't directly from the guidelines, but from a, another paper by Jeremy Sugarman, uh, who was a co-author on the HPTN guidelines, uh, was this notion of the rebuttal presumption. And this really makes a lot of sense to us here at TAG, um, that rather than trying to name all of the situations in which PrEP should be provided, that really the onus should be on researchers to justify why they're not offering PrEP within a trial. And so that's something that we should uh, perhaps uh, have as our standard lens looking at this moving forward. Finally, a, a lot of those recommendations are really about the standard uh, background package of HIV prevention um, interventions. There's another question which is uh, against what should new modalities be tested. Um, should it be tested against a placebo or because PrEP is very uh, effective, should it be tested, you know, and shown to be non-inferior to oral Truvada as PrEP? And uh, the UNAIDS WHO guidelines state that use of placebo is really only acceptable when no HIV prevention modality of the type being studied has been validated, which makes sense. And as we're seeing in the DISCOVER trial right now, which is comparing oral Discovy to oral Truvada um, as PrEP, uh, you know, that's a non-inferiority study that we're seeing, which makes sense. But it does leave the question about what do we mean by sort of comparable modality in this case. Obviously, it's applicable to other oral PrEPs, but what about things like long-acting injectable PrEP formulations, broadly neutralizing antibodies, um, vaccine research? Um, and it leaves a little bit of gray area there. Next slide, please. So moving on from the guidelines, we looked at some real-world examples of how different uh, trials have approached these issues. One of, one of, if not the first trial um, that was faced with this particular dilemma was HVTN505, which was a, a vaccine trial that was uh, being compared to placebo. It was originally designed in 2009 before we uh, had IPREX data establishing PrEP as an effective prevention option. But of course, those results came out in the midst of them recruiting for the trial, um, which prompted them to convene community and key stakeholders for consultations to get advice on how to move forward. They did consider um, looking at some sort of trial design to look at combined efficacy, um, but they found that that would be uh, not feasible. It would make it overly complex and just too large of a trial to do that. 
And so they found themselves left with three options. One, uh, to only provide information on PrEP to trial participants. Two, to provide information and then outside referral to uh, the medication and associated services with getting on to PrEP. Or number three, to provide information and then actually all of uh, the, the services and the medication required for PrEP as part of the trial. In the end, they ended up choosing option three and secured a, a donation of Truvada from Gilead and uh, arranged for mail, pharmacy, uh, mail order pharmacy when required. They also increased uh, their enrollment from uh, 1,350 participants to 2,200 participants, partly to accommodate for PrEP uptake. Um, in the end, though, while this is informative in terms of how researchers might approach this issue, um, ultimately it was a non-issue as only 13 individuals started PrEP. Next slide, please. Looking at uh, some other completed and ongoing trials, we see some other examples. As I said, with the DISCOVER study, we're looking at oral Discovy uh, in a non-inferiority uh, study being compared to Truvada as PrEP using a double dummy approach uh, where the experimental arm is receiving actual Discovy and fake Truvada and the control arm is receiving actual Truvada and fake Discovy so nobody knows uh, which arm they are in, um, and we'll be seeing results from that in 2020. Um, looking at uh, the ongoing trials, uh, phase three trials for long-acting injectable cabotegravir as PrEP, um, we're also seeing a double dummy approach with this, um, and uh, Truvada is also being provided for up to 48 weeks after the trial for participants. Um, what's interesting about that is, of course, as I stated earlier, there's a bit of a question about what modalities are comparable to oral PrEP. Is injectable PrEP, you know, comparable? In this case, they made the decision that it was and that it actually, uh, you know, or they made the decision to make it as available as, as possible um, and, and made that decision. Um, looking at uh, the two ongoing efficacy trials of passive immunization, with broadly neutralizing antibody VRC01, otherwise known as the AMP studies. Um, these are two parallel studies, but we're actually seeing two different approaches to providing PrEP, which is of interest. Um, in HVTN704, uh, which is uh, looking at men who have sex with men and transgender women, Truvada PrEP is being offered free of charge to all participants as accessible as possible. In 703, which is looking at uh, the AMP study in women, however, only information and outside referrals to PrEP are being offered. And this is being, uh, you know, their, their justification for this is that some of the recommendations, some of the evidence has been different for those two populations. But that's a, a, an interesting uh, divergence in that study. And then finally, in HVTN702, uh, which is an ongoing HIV vaccine efficacy trial in South Africa, they're providing outside referrals only, um, but this has led to some controversy, which is something to consider. It's also led uh, one notable uh, South African uh, you know, HIV prevention advocate to know another ethical obligation that we might want to keep on our radars which is that trials would do well to engage advocates to explore opportunities to accelerate the national PrEP agenda. If we're going to different countries and conducting our research there, what are our obligations to actually advancing uh, comprehensive prevention access in that context? Something to keep in mind. Next slide, please. And then finally, uh, one other consideration that came up in the uh, literature review was uh, that TDFFTC uh, and vaccines may have additive or synergistic effects, which is something that we, we could keep in mind as a complication, but definitely as an opportunity and how we're evaluating these things. Um, uh, part of the evidence primarily derives from studies in SIV macaque models, um, but it has also been reported that some participants in the IPREX study developed T cell responses to HIV that were associated with reduced infection risk, although this has not been a universal finding and an analysis of participants 
and the Partners PrEP efficacy trial did not find evidence for such an association. Um, in another key paper that we looked at around this, uh, by Holly Janes and et al., a 2013 paper, uh, looked at the opportunity for possible synergy between PrEP and vaccines, uh, making the point that in the future we may have several different partially effective but not fully effective HIV prevention options. And so we should really perhaps be looking at how we could combine these things together into packages to provide a more uh, comprehensive uh, sort of prevention package. And she notes um, that although future efficacy trials will be more complex in their design, should we follow that, um, that they may become more relevant and applicable to diverse populations and better suited to the ultimate goal of reducing HIV incidence at a population level. So in some ways, perhaps we should be welcoming that complexity. Next slide, please. I'm going to go very quickly through our questionnaire, which we designed uh, in partnership with uh, some other prevention advocacy partners and launched in March 7th of this year and closed in March 20th. It was a quick turnaround, but we did get a number of responses and uh, I'll report on that here. Next slide, please. We got 49 responses uh, from individuals in 11 countries. It was uh, primarily uh, you know, responses from the U.S. We did get a substantial amount from South Africa, Brazil, and Canada, and um, a, a smattering from other countries. Uh, just some things to keep in mind in terms of the context uh, some of these responses came from. 87% reported that PrEP is approved in their country. 60.9% say that it is accessible without difficulties. And 92% um, had uh, participated in some sort of HIV prevention research advocacy in the past two years, and nearly all had been in at least one community advisory board at some point, which makes sense since that was the population we were targeting. Next slide, please. So some key findings from this before I jump into our recommendations. Um, so one thing that we were curious about was uh, with uh, being part of a CAB, what sort of input is being solicited from them and what sort of uh, outcomes do they see um, in terms of actual application for the trial? And um, because I'm running low on time, I won't go through this um, extensively, but you will see that in some cases, for example, the informed consent, um, you know, the majority are being asked about how informed consent rolls out, but 70% felt that it was not being reflected in the final results. Um, and, you know, there is a disparity also, you see that with recruitment materials, um, where the majority are always or sometimes being um, uh, solicited, but, you know, it, that could be improved. However, when there is solicitation of that advice, then it is incorporated a bit more. And so it opens some, some opportunities where we might look in the future to make sure that we're comprehensively utilizing CABs and, and taking up their, their responses. Next slide, please. We also uh, asked just sort of a broadly, broad yes or no question of uh, whether or not TDFFTC should be offered and, and considered standard of HIV prevention and provided to participants. 86%, you know, a clear majority said yes. Um, however, as one uh, respondent uh, noted, this is not a yes or no answer. While on the one hand, uh, they agree that PrEP should be part of risk reduction packages, it is nuanced. There's a big difference between providing, facilitating access, or allowing participants who are in PrEP to continue using it. Um, so a little more clarity on that in a few slides. Next slide, please. Um, and uh, this slide we wanted to look at for which study participants should F uh, TDF FTC prep be offered. Um, and uh, responses were comparable across all five of the clinical trial scenarios listed with approximately 75% of respondents recommending TDF FTC in control uh, placebo arms of all biomedical prevention trials. Fewer respondents recommended it and control, uh, control arms uh, 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 recommended it in active experimental product arms, uh, rather, 
And uh, so there's a little bit of variation there, but certainly a lot of support for it to be provided in, in a, uh, a number of different contexts. Next slide, please. Finally, we wanted a bit more clarity on exactly how PrEP should be provided. Um, and the vast majority uh, said that in trials that it should be provided free um, and that services related to, to using PrEP should also be provided for free. 27.9%, the second most popular option, said that referrals to both the medication and the associated services were appropriate. Um, the third most popular option, 23.9% uh, said that the medication should be provided for free, but the services can be referred outside, um, while a clear minority uh, advocated for education um, on PrEP only. And then, uh, as you see there in Figure 7, another interesting finding was in uh, talking with CABS and uh, getting CABS inputs uh, and, and training CABS, on TDF-FTC provision in trials, we have a long way to go. We have about half of trials, uh, you know, sort of involving their CAB, CABs effectively in that discussion um, all the time, but certainly some room to grow. Next slide, please. So going through all of these resources, we basically came up with five different key recommendations that I'll just read through before uh, I pass the baton over to Stacy. Um, and, and we also drew from our own sort of personal expertise um, in working in HIV prevention um, at, at TAG and, and um, what we've seen over time. So one, uh, participants in all biomedical prevention trials should be provided with education and referrals for oral TDF FTC prep and accompanying services as part of a standard prevention package. That seems clear. Trials should routinely provide data on the number of participants who have been successfully linked to PrEP as a way of monitoring impartial education referrals to PrEP. If we're, if we're going to say that the standard is that this is being offered, then we should have some way of checking that it's being effectively offered, and so it's important for us to, to perhaps data on, on uptake so we understand what's going on. Number two, novel oral PrEP regimens must be shown to be non-inferior to oral TDF-FTC and never compared with placebo. Again, that's very clear in what we're seeing in the DISCOVER trial. Next slide, please. Number three, given the high efficacy and large evidence base for TDF-FTC PrEP, it should be the standard that researchers opting for only passive referrals to PrEP or placing restrictions on PrEP use among trial participants must make the case for why they cannot or will not provide PrEP or allow PrEP in their trial. Again, that notion from Jeremy Sugarman, the rebuttal presumption really put the onus on researchers to say why they're not offering it. Number four, local community and key stakeholder input on PrEP provision is essential. CABs should be trained and consulted on PrEP provision in biomedical trials. Clearly, we need to uh, effectively engage the communities um, that are affected by these decisions. Next slide. And then finally, number five, GPP guidelines should be the standard by which trials operate, and GPP guidelines should be integrated into the uh, UNAIDS, WHO, and HPTN guidelines. Again, GPP goes even more in depth into really how to meaningfully engage community, and so we're big fans of, of making sure that that's the standard. Um, guidelines must be updated to reflect evolving community perspectives on PrEP provision clinical trials. We really need to understand um, from our, our guiding, uh, you know, influencing entities in this field exactly what we should be doing. And then my last slide. Uh, additional considerations. So those, those were for all different trials. Um, but one thing that was very clear is that no one-size-fits-all approach is going to work. Um, key ethical considerations beyond that for PrEP provision that people will need to keep in mind is what is the modality? What are the medications being tested? Is the modality being tested comparable to oral PrEP? That might change, um, you know, how, uh, whether we're comparing it to placebo or how we're offering it. Um, we need to be looking at additive and synergistic effects um, and looking that, at that not only as a challenge but an opportunity. Um, we need to remember that we have an ethical obligation to develop new prevention technologies. 
And so that, you know, there is that tension against, uh, you know, how we're providing PrEP in these trials. Um, we need to consider the local context, approval status of TDFFTC as PrEP, um, and other significant barriers to local access. Is it appropriate to mirror or exceed real-world accessibility? And then finally, to keep in mind novel approaches, uh, are there more complex but rewarding trial designs, something innovative that we can be doing to, to really come up with better compromises? Um, one suggestion that was brought up in uh, our questionnaire was that recruitment of individuals who decline PrEP and or are intolerant could be you know, of use. However, that might introduce a significant selection bias, so not sure how feasible that is, but certainly thinking outside the box. So with that, I've taken up way too much time and left Stacy and Deborah with not enough, but I'll pass it over and many thanks for listening. Great. Jeremiah, thank you so much. Um, a lot of great questions have come in, um, and we will get to them uh, as quickly as we can. Uh, but I want to very quickly um, turn it over to Stacey Hanna, who is here at AVAC and leads research engagement at AVAC, and particularly around our uh, good participatory practice work that you heard a bit about uh, um, from Jeremiah. And I'll turn it over to Stacey to take us through um, um, the perspective from GPP. Okay. Can you hear me okay? Yes, indeed. Go ahead. Okay, good. Um, so, so thanks. I, so I'm just going to try <laughs> to take um, just a few minutes to, again, kind of set, you know, and, and I think Jeremiah, you set these up as up really, really nicely. Um, but I think to help people sort of understand where we're coming from with, um, with GPP in particular um, and how GPP is really sort of applied to, to this case. Um, specifically, and, and I think at the end, just to really kind of get into some more sort of concrete, practical um, sort of lessons for for this for this current scenario. So, um, next, Levi. Um, so, GBP. I think most people know know what GBP is, but I have to sort of start out with this slide. Um, and, and Jeremiah again gave a, a nice introduction, but um, it is a, a, a set of guidelines. It's used um, quite quite a bit now um, in the clinical trials context for HIV prevention. Um, also, has actually been adapted to, to other disease areas um, as well. So we're we're seeing GPP this. Um, these sort of standardized guidelines being applied actually pretty um, pretty widely uh, in the clinical trials context now. Um, they were developed in 2007 and um, and re-released in 2011. So um, so we're coming up on the or we're actually at the 10th anniversary of of GPP, which is really exciting. Um, so next slide. So, and one of the things I think just to kind of start this out with is to make the point that there are many, many stakeholders um, when we talk about when we talk about GPP. You know, obviously, uh, it, and again, most of you have probably seen this diagram before, and, and potentially are even very familiar with it. But it, but it shows sort of these this different kind of these different layers of stakeholders that sort of exist around the clinical trials context. And I think, you know, in the middle there you see the trial participant, which is really, um, the, you know, the most important stakeholder um, in, in, in a clinical trial. Um, but then going out you have, um, you have stakeholders at, at all of these different levels. And I think especially when we're talking about things like standard of prevention, standard of care, and certainly um, this case that we're dealing with right now is sort of the era of PrEP rollout and what that means for, for trials, it's really important to think across all of these different layers, um, which stakeholders should be involved, which stakeholders are going to have expertise, and which stakeholders should be kind of involved in, in conversations and decision making. Um, so next slide. Um, taking uh, taking this opportunity to provide a little bit of GBP training, um, just to mention that the, the GBP, I know some people are probably really, really familiar with the contents of it, and some people just probably know the acronym. Um, either one is fine, but I think, um, you know, just to point out, GBP is a very, very, you know, I think one of the reasons that it's been, it's been it's taken on so well is that it's a really systematic document, um, the systematic set of guidelines. And, and the way it's structured is it sort of goes through 
the different, um, the different sort of pieces of the clinical trial life cycle, we call those topic areas. And the tenth one is actually standard of HIV prevention. So that's what we're going to be, um, you know, that's obviously the, the topic area that we would look to to sort of apply to, to this conversation around PrEP provision and trials. Um, I'm not going to go into all the fine print on this, on this slide. Um, but I think just to point out that, um, that, that, you know, like Jeremiah said, GBP does go into quite a bit of detail in terms of, um, of the steps that, that research teams should really take to ensure that stakeholders are, um, are meaningfully involved in, um, in, in this area and, you know, in the trial process as a whole, but, you know, in this, in this specific area. Um, if you read through this, you know, and, and, and it does go into some, um, some kind of content-specific detail here, um, you know, and, and can kind of see that if your eyes are good and you're looking, you're looking closely. But, you know, some of these things that are listed here are actually quite mundane, like maintaining documentation of, um, of stakeholder engagement and, and conversations and, and decisions that are made um, and, and providing funding. Um, and, and these things seem kind of obvious, but, but I think in terms of GPP and sort of community and stakeholder engagement, they're oftentimes overlooked. So that's something um, that, that is really important to, to point out. Um, so next slide. And then the other piece that GPP outlines for each of these topic areas are sort of special considerations. Um, and I just wanted to kind of take, you know, I just wanted to sort of bullet these out so everyone was aware of the, specifically the special considerations that are outlined for this topic area of standard of HIV prevention. Um, so you see things that, you know, again, are probably, you know, relatively obvious. Um, you know, in, in this case, different things that will impact on the, you know, the ability of researchers to, to kind of um, provide PrEP or provide, you know, refer, refer, referrals to PrEP in a trial, but things like national re re legal restrictions, funding body restrictions, um, this kind of idea of the, 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 the sort of the changing landscape and something that I'll kind of touch on a little bit in the next several slides. Um, and, and then finally, this point of kind of the, the need for ongoing stakeholder literacy and engagement around this. So um, that it's not sort of a, a, a one-shot deal. This is something that really should um, be incorporated into, into, the, into the trial and into this context as it changes through the, through the course of the trial. Um, and then I think the, the, the one thing, again, to point out is that GPP really does um, – you know, put the onus on the on the research teams. So if there are you know if there are different issues to work through around kind of any of these special considerations, the 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 it is still the responsibility of the research team to ensure that decisions around standard of prevention are being made with um, with full input from from stakeholders. Um, so next slide. So I'm going to transition a little bit in the in the um, in the next several slides, and this is just to kind of provide the the context of um, of where we are with with prep provision and trials. Um, and I'm not going to dwell on these too much because actually Jeremiah touched on a lot of the detail to go into. But um, but this slide that you're seeing here is actually um, an infographic that, that we really like at AVAC. It's available on our website um, that shows sort of the current landscape of specifically of efficacy trials um, and all sort of the, the, different, the different trials that are actually being, being rolled out currently um, that, we see, um, that we see happening and, and that we're, you know, and that are, I think, playing into this really evolving conversation around what are, you know, how are we incorporating PrEP into these trials. To the next slide. Um, and, and then this slide is actually just sort of a, a repeat of, the, of the, the former slide. It's not quite as pretty, um, but what we did is we added this last column around PrEP status and really sort of got into the, to the detail of, you know, not just is PrEP being provided or is, you know, PrEP education being provided or, you know, or referrals, but, you know, really the detail of how that's happening um, in each one of these protocols. And, it, and it, I think um, this is a really interesting one to kind of see how the PrEP status in each of these trials kind of stacks up 
um, you know, one against the other. And Jeremiah actually, you know, described this really well. I think um, one of the most interesting cases here is is in the two AMP studies um, and the very sort of different scenarios of, of prep provision that are happening there. So I think just also to make the point that, you know, um, the, the provision of PrEP is going to be sort of dependent on, you know, on a number of different factors. And so what you see here is that it's, dependent, it's going to be dependent on, you know, the, pro, the protocols itself, but also the geographies where these trials are being rolled out as well as the different populations. And, and that's all, you know, and, and there's, um, you know, that's, that's, all, that's all fine. That's the way it should be. But I think what GPP really sort of makes the case for is that there should be real transparency around that kind of information and transparency around how those decisions are, are being made. Um, and ideally, you know, all of these stakeholders should actually be involved in how those decisions around prep provision are, are made. The next slide. Um, this, this slide is, this graphic is, is one of my favorites, actually, um, and just shows the kind of the lineup of country by country of different trials that are, different efficacy trials that are happening in the country, as well as, you know, the, the PrEP status in, in so the kind of the national context of PrEP status. So what you see here, and, and I think one of the important points to make is that, um, you know, the UNAIDS ethical considerations, as well as GBP, kind of talk about um, PrEP being available, PrEP being kind of scientifically validated, but then PrEP being available in the country. And I think, you know, one of the, one of the really sort of important conversations to have is that that idea of PrEP availability is, can be defined in a lot of different ways. And so, um, so what we've done is we've outlined um, the, different, um, the different pieces of PrEP availability in these different countries. So there are different stages, obviously, of approval and licensure, um, there are guidelines, there are demonstration projects, and then all the way to, you know, something like national, national rollout um, and, and scale up of prep provision. And so you can kind of see the, the lineup of what's happening in each of these countries. And I think it's just a really good resource as we're looking at um, lots of trials, lots of efficacy trials being rolled out in lots of different countries. Um, so next slide. And then this is just the same information in um, – a prettier format, so I'll um, I'll skip over that. But just I think to note that these resources are all available, um, publicly available, right on our website. And then this one, um, I I really want to give the credit to um, our partner this RHI in South Africa for putting this graphic together, and and it shows all that it really goes down into the site level um, to look at what trials are happening at a given site, um, and and you know. Because I think, you know, again, we know that this is, this is becoming a really crowded space, which, again, is very exciting. We're really glad that all of these efficacy trials are moving forward. Um, but, you know, again, what does that mean? And especially what does that mean for something like PrEP provision, especially in a country like South Africa where um, there are, you know, various sort of scenarios of, of PrEP rollout. Um, and so just really important, I think, to note the different trials that are happening in the same sites and, and in the same communities. Um, I know that, that um, different sort of trial networks and, and research institutions are talking about instead of having a, you know, a per protocol, um, you know, prep provision policy, there's lots of, lots of alliteration there, um, having, having more of sort of a site-based approach. Um, and I think, you know, we at AVAC are really supportive of, of that kind of approach. I think it makes, you know, a lot, of different, a, lot of, a lot of sense. Obviously, you wouldn't want, you know, one trial kind of giving, a, a, you know, providing PrEP in a different way from another trial being offered at the same site. Um, one thing to note is that, and, you know, again, if you have really good eyes and can, can read all the, the, the fine print, you'll see that, that you know, here, and this is just showing South Africa, um, but there are sites that are going to be um, they're going to be conducting placebo controlled trials as well as um, trials that have prep as oral prep as the active arm, um, and so those scenarios obviously are going to be very different. And I think that's and I think this is something that Deb um, Danell is going to touch on a little bit. But just I think to make that point as we think about more sort of site level um, action and consideration. So next slide. Um, and then finally, I think 
I'm going to kind of transition now into kind of talking about what this means for GPP. Um, at AVAC, you, you know, people are probably very familiar with seeing, you know, this is, our, this is um, what we've talked about for many years, this sort of 3D approach to ending the epidemic. So while we need to, you know, we need to sort of, we need to deliver what we have now, we also really need to kind of focus on R&D for, for new options. Um, and, and the end of this epidemic is going to involve all of it, um, and that's something that you know we, as advocates, are you know this is just our guiding mantra. Um, but I think you know one thing to that is really important um, as we think about trials is you know just how important it is not to sort of pick one um, one intervention versus another, or, or when we're advocating for new trials to kind of say, well, we really need better options, or this option might be might be suboptimal. And I think around some of these, especially some of these new um, trials of um, the next generation prep, those conversations are getting um, are getting are getting much more difficult and much more confusing, especially from the advocacy perspective. So just I think to um, to to make that point. The so next slide. Um, so finally, you know, what does this all mean for GPP in real life? This is, these are just a few bullets. Um, I think to kind of make the case, um, of some, of, some of the lessons that we've learned, kind of GPP implementation 10 years down the line, um, GPP doesn't just mean a cab. It doesn't just mean a stakeholder consultation. I think oftentimes um, we can get into this sort of mentality, this kind of check the box mentality and, oh, we, you know, we've got the cab and we've, got, we've done this stakeholder consultation. Um, but I think really kind of um, highlighting this sort of fourth, fourth, uh, or the, one of the later bullets, um, the GDP is is about having a strategy. It's about really identifying which stakeholders you need to involve, um, and then finally this, you know, and in, in, in what conversations. And then this last point I really want to drive home: GDP means ensuring stakeholders agree that their involvement has been meaningful. I think oftentimes. This is where we, we. This is what we run, run the risk of when we think about those sort of tech, check the box um, kinds of GPP actions. Um, we can do them, but is that engagement meaningful? And I think Jeremiah touched on some of the feedback that they got in, in the survey um, that really I think highlighted this point as well. Um, and now finally, sort of how does it all ap apply to prep? Um, I think, you know, again, what we'll be really watching is to make sure that conversations around prep provision and trials really go beyond, beyond the site level cabs. Um, again, thinking about that sort of that onion that I showed at the beginning, um, making sure that there's a strategy, making sure that we know the input that we want to get from stakeholders. Um, cabs are very important. Community level stakeholders are very important. Um, but this broad array of stakeholders is really important. And so um, ensuring that there's a strategy and that there's follow through with, with them um, is so important. Um, the second point is you know, stakeholders are closely, these, you know, especially in country advocates, are very close to national rollout of PrEP in their countries. And they actually, you know, this is one area where they can really play an important role, I think, in help, helping um, trialists figure out you know, what is the right way and what are the right systems to, to, to link PrEP rollout to, to the clinical trials. Um, again, the PrEP landscape is shifting, um, and so this stakeholder engagement should be ongoing. Um, for those who are paying attention, I think um, the HVTN at their meeting just earlier this week kind of talked about that in the, in the upcoming HVTN 705 trial, that um, they would be sort of re, rechecking this um, you know, kind of the, the prep landscape and prep provision regularly throughout that trial, and that's something that is is great and something we'll certainly be watching. And then finally, I think just this point: GDP doesn't always mean um, that the community is right, but it does mean that they're, the community is going to bring and advocates are going to bring really important perspectives, really important um, expertise to this conversation, um, and they should be um, they, sh they should be engaged in this ongoing dialogue, and and these decisions should really truly be collaborative. Um, so I'll end there with, and then just one last slide to to show some resources to go to. Um, and just to make the point, we've um, we have a new podcast series um, called PX Pulse, which actually, in one of them, um, outlines this um, this this issue specifically, and then some of our GPP resources as well. Great. Stacy. thank you so, so much. Um, that was terrific, both you and Jeremiah. And actually, the, la the first bullet on this slide about the podcast is a perfect um, segue. Um, a number of questions actually came in um, about 
the, the challenges and differences between the placebo-controlled trials, in which we talk about the standard of prevention, and active control trials. And, and that is obviously a new space in HIV prevention research. And the, one of the podcasts um, that just got launched is with Deborah Dinell from the Fred Hutch and, and the HIV Prevention Trials Network, who has worked on the statistical and trial designs related to a range of trials in the past placebo-controlled and more recently around uh, um, the HPTN 083 and 084 trials looking at injectable cabotegravir. So, um, Deb, maybe as we turn it and open it up for questions and conversations, a bunch of questions came in about the different considerations related to um, um, placebo versus non-placebo active control trials. And I wonder, um, just to, before we get into the specific questions, if you wanted to um, just provide a bit of perspective and some of the considerations from the trial designer statistical perspective as you think about these issues. And star seven to unmute if you are muted and speaking. I was asking if you could hear me, so I guess you couldn't. Can now, you now I can. That's fantastic. Go ahead, Deb. Okay. So when I'm uh, approaching the designing of these trials along with the community of scientists who are interested in these se separate modalities, I think one thing that has emerged when we're looking at these trials is we are thinking about um, prevention drugs that involve antiretroviral therapies as different from um, approaches that don't involve ARVs, like monoclonal antibodies and vaccines. And anything that involves an antiretroviral, we believe we have sufficient proof that these are most likely to work, that it only makes sense to compare those against um, Truvada, Truvada PrEP or oral PrEP. The thinking being that they would be alternative strategies to something that already works. Whereas with monoclonal antibodies and vaccines, to date, we don't have any proof in humans that those prevent HIV at all. So we really need to ask the simple question, do they work, you know, do they reduce HIV infections or not? And that is why in the monoclonal antibody trials and in vaccine trials, it's very important to have an arm that is, sort of, that is, getting, um, that is not getting the vaccine. So um, the last point I just want to make, because I'm very cognizant we're nearly out of time, but one of the things I think that I want to make clear to people that when you're doing a placebo-controlled trial, clearly you need to show that there were fewer infections happening on the vaccine arm or the monoclonal antibody arm in order to show that they're preventing HIV. So that's a very clear, like, simple concept. You should see fewer infections. In a trial where you're comparing two active agents, like oral PrEP, Truvada versus something like a long-acting injectable like cabotegravir, what you have to show there is that essentially they're both working. Um, and so that, that's conceptually much harder. So for instance, if we do a cabotegravir versus Truvada trial, we may end up with very similar number of infections in both arms. We might have 27 on the cabotegravir arm and 27 infections on the placebo, uh, on the PrEP arm. And the question is, those are similar, but how do you know that they're both working? And that's sort of fundamentally the, the, the difficult issue with non-inferiority trials, is you have to basically uh, be sure that the oral PrEP is being used in a way that it's working, and you also have to make a decision before you design the trial about how similar is similar enough. Um, and that's sort of some of the challenges we, we have when we're designing these non-inferiority trials and some of the things that make them, um, that, that make them difficult. And so I think just in closing, um, I think we all know that, we, that oral PrEP is highly effective, but if oral PrEP were highly effective for everybody all the time, we'd be kind of done. It would be like a vaccine. And when we're not in that situation... So we find when we're designing trials, it, it, we kind of know that in disclosed serodiscordant partnerships, PrEP use is likely to be very high. And so that's not an area of need for prevention, in theory anyway. <laughs> Whereas if we're working with young women in sub-Saharan Africa, or we're working with a population that have difficulty adhering to, prep, uh, to oral PrEP in any way, that's our area of need. And so in a way, when we're working with trial populations, and trying to design these trials, we are trying essentially to continue to work in the area where there's still a large prevention need. So I'm going to stop there, Mitch, so that there's some chance for questions. <laughs>
Great. Thanks so much, Deb. And we are at the top of the hour, but I, I, a lot of people, most people are still on and realize we've gone over on presentation now, but really do want to make sure um, that we continue the conversation for as long as people are there. And one question came in early on, actually, and it's really for, I guess, all of you. Uh, Jeremiah, uh, relating to something that Deb just said, in one of your recommendations, you talked about novel oral prep regimens must be shown to be non-inferior in, in terms of the recommendations from the report. And, and Deb, you just talked about um, other ARV-based prevention. And, and just wanted to clarify, because someone asked the question, what about non-oral prep regimens? So uh, any number of other interventions. And I wonder, both Jeremiah and Deb, since you kind of have, have gone, you know, raised those, is there a difference between comparing oral to oral that's different than non-oral ARV to oral ARV prep? Maybe I might to start with you given the recommendation to start with. Yeah, sure. I mean, I, I largely support what, what you know, Deborah just said. We didn't go quite as far to say that, you know, if we're looking at, you know, any sort of ARV-based modality, you know, ho however it is introduced to, to someone's system, you know, we didn't go that, that far to say that. Um, what we were saying is that, you know, the, the clearest, uh, you know, advice that we get from the guidelines is that an oral prep regimen like Truvada should certainly not uh, be compared to placebo, or, you know, a, a, new, a new oral prep regimen should not be compared to placebo. It should be non-inferior to Truvada. Um, but as we've seen with the, the Cavitegravir um, trials, uh, you know, there they, they're also you know doing doing sort of a double dummy uh, approach, and so I think you know what we might start to see is in the, the real world it's sort of anything with ARVs, however it's being introduced, you know that we we should be um, not necessarily comparing it to, to placebo. And I think Deborah made a a, a good point there uh, because we we can sort of have a good sense that it's all going to work to some degree anyway. Um, so, you know, that's a bit different when we're looking at, you know, antibodies, which we're not sure, you know, or, or other sort of modalities that, you know, we don't have as, as much background knowledge on how, if, if, if it's going to be effective in, in any sort of way. Um, but Deborah, you can maybe go over that point again more. Yeah, I, the only thing I would add to that is when I've been thinking about or working with people on designing trials for an oral pill versus an injectable pill, one clear distinction we make is there would be no expectation for a new oral pill that people would have. Deb? Hey, wow. did I, did, can you hear Deb? I can't hear her. No, I can't. Oh, no, Deb. Okay. Um, we'll try to get Deb back on. I wasn't sure if that was just me. Um, maybe while we try to sort out that technical issue, let me um, just quickly then, maybe both for Jeremiah and Stacy, both of you talked about um, the, the importance of what needs to happen uh, in, in terms of the way the decisions get made to offer PrEP, to design the standard of prevention. And you both allude to it. I wonder if you both wanted to just make some comments about how one might monitor and hold any number of, of, of stakeholders accountable. So beyond just saying this is what we're doing in terms of referral or in terms of delivery, um, have either, could either of you think or talk a bit about what thoughts you might have in terms of how the monitoring to ensure that that's happening um, in practice? Yeah, I, I can definitely jump in on that. Um, and I, you know, I mean, I think that this is where, and this is, I think the the point that I was making pretty broadly in terms of the need for a real sort of strategic, comprehensive GPT plan um, to be in place, sort of around trials or sort of at at the site level, or maybe around kind of a prep provision um, policy specifically. Um, oftentimes, you know. Again, I think there, there's, um, you know, there, there will be a stakeholder consultation that will happen or sort of a CAB meeting that, that will happen kind of around an issue, but there's often not, not, oftentimes not a sort of a system that gets put into place to actually kind of monitor that and follow up. I mean, first of all, to see if stakeholders have, have considered their input to be meaningful, but also really to kind of give stakeholders a, a specific role in the trial. I think that this is, you know, and I'll have conversations with, Members of research teams, and they'll they it's you know they they just 
sometimes say, well, I just don't even understand the role that advocates should be playing or that, you know, some of these different stakeholders should be playing as we, can, as we conduct the trial. I think this is a really, really um, great uh, example of a specific role that kind of advocates or community members could play in partnership with a research team to say, you know, we're going to, um, we're going to, we're going to monitor and we'll be the sort of the sounding board um, for, for whether or not you're actually sort of following through on these, um, on the, on these sort of systems and policies that you've laid out and, and, and even to get into details of, you know, what are your counseling messages when you're talking to young women, young women about the option of, of, of PrEP, of oral PrEP? Um, you know, what, what happens with your referrals? How many, you know, if you're making PrEP referrals, are people actually going to get them? Are you, are you following up? So I think that there's a lot of detail that, that could really be fleshed out there. Great. Thanks. Um, Jeremiah, I wonder, in, as you reflect, I mean, were there um, ideas either coming from the survey or from TAG itself in terms of some of how to ensure that whatever a good, wherever a good process lands us, that it's actually being implemented. Any, any thoughts on that as well? In terms of PrEP provision and, and the trial, uh, you know, I think one in, in our top recommendation that we had, I think it should just be standard that however, you know, it's being offered. Um, you know, the, one, I, I think that it really should be the standard going forward that researchers are, are following that rebuttal presumption that Jeremy Sugarman brings up you know, that rather than sort of outlining just where they're going to do it, saying why they're not offering it or why they're only passively referring it. And I think that's important. And in, term, in terms of making sure that, you know, whatever protocol they come up with is being adhered to, I think it, it's important for it to be sort of regular practice for us to see, you know, just how much uh, PrEP was, was taken up by participants. If it's exceptionally low, that's not necessarily the fault of, you know, people operating the trial, but it uh, might indicate that something went awry or, or didn't work well. And I, I agree with, with Stacey, you know, this is an opportunity to really work with your community advisory board to make sure that everything is, is going well. That, uh, you know, um, from our questionnaire, we're seeing that there are, you know, opportunities to better train community advisory boards on this discussion. So. You know, CABs, this is a newer issue, so a lot of CAB members might need to sort of have a, a forum to sort of become more familiar with some of the, the um, ethical tensions in the situation and what's happening. Um, and uh, uh, to, uh, you know, actually solicit their, their uh, input on it and keep them informed about how it's going within the trial. That's super helpful, Jeremy. That reminds me of something I think on one of your slides, Stacey. It's not just the engagement, it's the literacy and engagement so that people are actually really able to engage fully. Um, speaking of fully engaged, I wonder, Jeremy, if you might, a question came in about how representative this is. Obviously, you, you uh, uh, described a very rapid uh, turnaround time uh, to, to collect this information, and, and obviously a, a, quite a significant majority of respondents in the U.S., but as both you and Stacey outlined, many of the trials we're talking about about um, are happening in Southern Africa. And wonder um, uh, if you, in, in, with the small numbers you had, if you saw any variation between respondents coming outside of the U.S. and um, if you've thoughts about how um, those issues may play out quite differently at the country level and, and how that survey fits into the conversation uh, at a global uh, level and at a regional African level. Absolutely. I think that's a real limitation of, of the questionnaire as it sort of ended up rolling out was um, that it was so U.S. centric. And I think, you know, a, a good follow-up questionnaire would be one that focuses a, a bit more um, specifically outside of the U.S. Um, and would probably have a longer recruitment time for it. Um, in, in terms of how it broke down by country, I don't actually have that, um, you know, in front of me, but it's something that we should look at. Mm. No, that's great. And as, as I think many on this line probably know, there is a, a very important uh, set of meetings next week in South Africa um, to consider this very set of issues around the standard of prevention and prevention trials. Um, uh, a summit being convened by the South African Medical Research Council late next week and then earlier in the week preceded by a, an advocate's pre-meeting uh, um, to, to really talk about um, the issues in advance of the summit. So um, a lot of important conversations from the TAG report from the
from this webinar, from uh, trial designers and advocates and researchers and funders um, really to be funneled in next week. And um, we are very keen to maybe link all of that up after the summit to get a sense of that. And it might help complete some of the, the, the story uh, beyond the survey with a more U.S.-centric view. Um, I don't know if Deb, you're back on, but I wonder if, if two or three of you might want Oh, you are? Great. I don't know. We, we lost you in the middle of your thought. I don't know if you remember what your thought was, um, or we wanted, if you want to just keep going. I think it's probably better to keep going. It's fine. It's just fantastic. Better, but I think you're, you're probably in a different place at this point. Well, sorry about that, but it's great that you're back. Because one of the questions that came in um, from an advocate actually in, in Africa was this issue of uh, a number of people talked about the difference between protocol-specific plans for the standard compared to site specific plans. And, and again, you saw the slides from Stacy about many of these sites working in multiple modalities. And I think someone asked the question of, that makes a lot of sense to be at the site level, but um, who's then in charge? Is it the site? Is it the protocol? Is it the individual trial funder? And I don't know if any of the three of you have thoughts about that in terms of how um, a site navigates through that um, and how it has implications for trials. Um, when, when sites might have a consistency within what they're doing, but they're working in a bunch of different protocols. And I don't know if that came up in the survey at all, or if any of the three of you, or any, anyone on the line has thoughts about that. Um, I mean, well, I, 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 can, I can – go ahead, Deborah. <laughs> no, you go. You go. No, I was going to say that, you know, that wasn't something that we, we really looked at specifically and, you know, didn't come up with sort of – uh, specific recommendations on in this particular report. I think it's an interesting question, and I think that looking at Stacy's sli slide, you know, on um, just how much is going on in these different trial sites, you know, who's setting these sort of standards is an important question. Is it per protocol? Is it per site? Um, you know, I don't know that I have an answer for that right now. Great, but it sounds like Deborah might. Yeah, no, I do not have an answer. I was really going to say this is really, <laughs> this is really, really complex. I mean, part of me would say in what Jeremiah's presentation, he gave this kind of one, two, three options for a trial, and clearly within that option, there's like, well, if you're in this trial, this is what your access is, and then there are, the option number two was, you know, we'll tell you about the resources that are available locally, and you can go get them. But you can see that there are currently sites where. If you, if you enter this trial, you can get Truvada. <laughs> if you enter this trial, you can get randomized to Truvada, so you mm -hmm. have a 50% chance of getting Truvada, 50% chance of getting something else. And if you're at this site, you could actually go get PrEP if you're willing to go across the road and go to this other clinic. So mm. um, it's clearly very complex in a context, in any context where PrEP is not readily available for anyone who asks for it. So. I would say it's, it's a real navigation effort at the moment, and we can only hope that it will get simpler <laughs> as um, programs get rolled out, and then you'd be more in a situation where hopefully people are at in the U.S. where they have the option of going to their doctor and getting Truvada if that's what they want, and they can also um, enroll in a clinical trial if they really want to contribute to research for future products. So, uh, you mm. know, it, it, it's a very difficult navigation at the moment, clearly. That's a really great point, Deborah. And I, I should say the map that Stacey showed that, that colleagues at Fitz RHI helped develop um, in, is really research focused, but lay, we, we're in the midst of uh, updating, layering on top of that where actual PrEP access through Department of National Health programs are happening, and this is something we're working on in a number of different countries. But I, I think to your point, and I may, it's both a comment, but actually maybe a question to all three of you. Um, it, it is complicated because of what you just described, Deborah, that it, the, the message is a little different in terms of you know, is it offered, is it an act of control, is it something across the road just in general practice. Um, I guess a question or comment is how might we ensure that it, no matter which of those access points one is at, that at least there's a consistent message about it. I think that maybe is an area of, of concern or question. You know, if it, it, it's what you said is true. I mean, you're going to have a different experience in each place, but what you're hearing about the, the issues, perhaps there's where we need the consistency and clarity of message so that people aren't not hearing how it's offered differently in each, but getting a different message about what PrEP is or isn't in each. And I don't know if any of you have thoughts about, about how one thinks about that. 
I mean, I think it goes into, you know, one of our, our final points about, you know, just making sure that you're taking into account the, the entire local context when you're coming, uh, you know, and, and making sure that your cab is informed on the entire local context before they make their recommendations. It's probably not going to be a one-size-fits-all approach, but I think it brings up the point that when we talk about local context, we also mean what other HIV prevention trials are going on there. Um, and what are the messages that they're putting out in order to understand, you know, how those should align, um, where there might be tensions, where it might um, inadvertently sort of, uh, you know, lead to, to sort of selection bias and, you know, and, and weird stratification of participants, you know, going to different trials. I think that's a great point from Deborah. Um, so, you know, it's, it's probably not going to be a simple answer, but it is part of that local context that you need to take into consideration. Mm. I think the comment that I would make, Mitch, is that I, I would hope that the messaging from the, to the community who are working with participants is, is sort of a clear prep works if you take it. And, and I would hope that that was consistent mm -hmm. across all trials and there wasn't any confusion of that particular message. And I'd actually be interested in knowing if, in a way, from the work that you do uh, in AVAC, is whether there is... Um, some way to ensure that that message doesn't get mixed up in in all these complexities of what trials are trying to do. It's a great point, Deborah. I don't know, Stacy. Do you want to respond to that at all? Sure. I mean, I, yeah, and that really kind of builds on 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 what what I was what I was going to say. I mean, I think you know what we're seeing right now in sort of the context of prep rollout as well as all of these different you know new interventions being tested in different types of trials is, is, is just this a whole new paradigm um, and and one of the things that we're dealing with i mean when it gets down to sort of the community engagement and and really sort of just the nuts and bolts of how gpp is um, gpp or sort of engagement in general however you know however it might be called by a different research institution um, is being rolled out. It's, you know, it's, traditionally, it's been very trial specific. Um, it's been very trial specific, or research institution specific, or network specific, um, what have you. And I think that we're, you know, I think, yeah, we're we're just, I think we're being called to sort of a new a new standard right now to ensure that um, we're not just taking this sort of trial by trial, or even you know, or even site by site, and that it truly is a, a, a broader conversation. I mean, I would say we also really need to kind of think about what's being messaged at, you know, at sort of national level, um, you know, not just what's being messaged kind of in the context of, of, of these trials and sort of counseling around prep rollout, but ensuring that maybe, you know, maybe it's even just that sort of trials um, you know, research institutions, research entities are maybe even kind of taking the lead from um, from 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 you know national programs and 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 national messaging and mm -hmm. and again, you know, this really is, I think, a a, um, a place for advocates to really kind of play a concrete role. Um, again, not that they're always going to going to be right or are going to know exactly the right way to sort of apply this to the trial's context, but. They can really provide leadership there, um, and 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 again, that's first kind of having that very strategic um, kind of GBP plan in place uh, comes comes into play. Now that that's great. Two, two I did. Points, oh, go ahead. Very, very quickly, two points sort of came to mind from Deborah and Stacy's comments. Um, and, and in terms of sort of like at least some standardization of, of messaging and, and ensuring that we are providing like a, a reasonable perspective of, of PrEP as a whole, you know, when we're advertising these things. Um, a number of community advocates had concerns, for example, with the DISCOVER trial uh, being run by, by Gilead Sciences comparing DISCOVY to Truvada, because we saw a lot of problematic messaging coming out of some of their, their trial sites for recruitment. Um, and in terms of, you know, how, how Truvada is being compared to DISCOVY, overemphasizing, you know, toxicities of Truvada. Truvada is a very good medication. Um, you know, while Discovy is going to be, you know, an important option should it prove to be non-inferior, uh, particularly for people who have had any sort of nephrotoxicity with it, you know, we want to make sure that we're not disparaging one modality in favor of another. Uh, we want to make sure that we're providing a fair perspective 
Um, so I think that's an interesting point to consider. And then one thing that, that Stacey keeps bringing up is um, I, I think it's also interesting to remember what we mean when we're saying community. Community isn't always right, quote unquote. I also think we use the term community very broadly <laughs> sometimes. Um, and, and forgetting that actually for, for you know, interventions targeting HIV negative, you know, people who are highly vulnerable, that's a different community sometimes than what we've been dealing with historically in HIV. It's not just people living with HIV. It's people who are at risk for it. And I think that's an interesting consideration too. No, that's great. And I do want, uh, Jeremy, you reminded me, I, I wanted to make an important shout out to, to, to my, uh, my friend and colleague, Jim Pickett, who reminds us that while GPP absolutely means that community is not always right, nor does it mean that funders or scientists or uh, um, investigators are always right either. And I think that's really a, a core message to remember across, all, across the board. All of these stakeholders uh, have a stake in it, hence the name, uh, but none of them are by definition right. And I think that really is core and, and, and obvious, but needs to be restated. We do have a couple of hands up, and I want to make sure, given, and I'm delighted everyone's still staying. So the reason you're still um, hearing us is because most of you are still on the line. Um, but a hand from South Africa, um, Edai, you, you both raised your hand, but also I see your question in the chat feature, which is a great one, and that is, um, do, do any of you have you know, the, these, the complexities that we long for, I think as you described it, Jeremiah, and as we've written about in the past, are there are there analogies um, of, from the past in other disease areas, in other public health areas, where we might be able to derive some lessons um, uh, to help guide us in terms of operationalizing all of this? So do any of the three of you have a, um, one or more examples from other areas where we've navigated through ethical dilemmas like this? I can say that the one area that I sometimes refer to for analogies is the area of contraception for women. Um, I don't know that it necessarily provides that much of an example for us because um, the development of contraceptives was done in a rather different era. But we do, um, we clearly have arrived at a place where we have contraceptives of different efficacies that have been developed in parallel. And we do make choices, uh, our, our children and, and ourselves make choices about which contraceptives to use based on both their efficacy and how they suit us at this time. Um, I, I don't really, as I said, I, the only thing is I, I don't think there was a history of um, developing those in parallel. And, and I also think that when we came up with these highly effective long-acting um, contraceptives, they were, they were not... 60 and 70 percent effective in the trials, they were like 90 something percent effective. So it's not quite the same, but that is one analogy that I could offer. Great. No, very helpful. Other thoughts? And I, oh, go ahead, Stace. I, so, yeah, I mean, I think one, you know, just thinking about the kind of the, the, these areas of standard of prevention and standard of care in trials, I mean, I think the obvious one that jumps out is some of those kind of initial conversations about, about HIV treatment for people who are converted in, in, in trials. Um, and, you know, and this was, I mean, I think, and obviously the two are very different scenarios and, um, you know, different implications on trial design and certainly different clinical implications. Um, but I think, you know, it was kind of still this broad issue of grappling with, you know, what do we do within sort of a trial context when there might be a disparity versus what's happening more at kind of the national level and how do we sort of reconcile those two. Um, and I think some real kind of um, uh, challenging you know, systems that had to be put in, put in place um, in terms of what would actually be provided to, um, to trial participants. But then I think you know what, and and I and I think a real grappling with of, of grappling with you know how treatment was actually going to get rolled out in a lot in a lot of these countries. But what we saw was that actually the two came together quite nicely, um, and I think probably everyone on the phone is, is familiar with that with that case. So, 
Yeah, no, Stacey, that's a really, I'm so glad you brought that up because I think, um, you know, I'm reminded back in the early 2000s, treatment wasn't really thought of as viable at scale, and now we have, you know, 19 million people in antiretroviral therapy. But there was actually a great piece written in those days, now 13, 14 years ago, by um, Larry Corey and the HIV Vaccine Trials Network, and they wrote about the, that, you know, they talked about this issue of the inequities and that, that we don't, we can't guarantee what's going to happen after the trial, but they wrote about the fact that no one research organization um, uh, can reverse gl global or national inequities, but researchers who have, you know, who come with resources from uh, elsewhere, like the U.S., who work in resource-limited settings, have an obligation to help narrow the equity gap. And they wrote that vaccine researchers can work with communities to develop, implement, and assess high-quality. They said then in 2003 treatment models, and I think what you just said reminds us that that same exact statement is true as they think about prevention trials. So. Um, you know, history does repeat itself. So 14 years ago, we had a very bold statement, and hopefully that will be the a guide for, for the future. So great. Thank you for that. I wonder, um, I also see Kamenthri, um, an, an old friend and, and leading ethicist in South Africa. You have your hand up. Um, if you want to hit star seven, do you want to um, introduce yourself and ask a question? Kamenthri, are you there? Unfortunately, Kamenthri didn't send her question in. All right. Um, well, let me pause then and see if anyone else on the line would like to. There are other questions I have not gotten to, and I'm happy to keep going. Uh, but maybe I'll pause while we see if Kamenthri can get off of mute with star seven. If anyone else wants to briefly introduce themselves and ask a question. Oh, yes, there you are. Hello. Welcome. Thank you. I have a question about the South African studies uh, where, as you may be aware, participants are promised access to PrEP via the demonstration sites. Now, the problem with this is that the demonstration sites, participants will, be, uh, will receive HIV testing before they may have access to PrEP. And for those who are on the vaccine arm, this has the potential to unblind the participants. Uh, do you have any comments on that? Uh, that's a fantastic question. So, uh, just uh, do you want to quickly introduce yourself, Kamenthri? Sure. I'm a, a professor and director of Center for Medical Ethics and Law at Stellenbosch University. I also chair the uh, Medical Research Council Research Ethics Committee. Fantastic. So glad you're on. Um, and I, there are others on this line who undoubtedly will also have opinions. What Kamenthri is referring to for those who don't um, uh, work in vaccines all the time is that in a number of vaccine trials, um, getting an HIV test because of the way the vaccines work, you may, um, in a test done outside of a clinical trial, um, be unblinded because of the presence of, uh, or, or what's called vaccine-induced seropositivity that it, that it shows on the test. Um, you are not HIV infected, but the test may come back that, that shows the presence of, of, of HIV. So it, it does become quite complicated. And it really speaks to how, you know, just saying we're going to refer people um, does raise additional issues and complications and argues for should the delivery of PrEP be done in a vaccine trial. And I don't know if anyone on the line, either uh, uh, Deborah, Jeremiah, Stacey, or others uh, uh, on the line want to respond to how that might get navigated by, by a trial. I mean, I, I feel like, you know, um, I, I want to channel Richard Jeffries, who, you know, is, is much more familiar with, um, you know, our vaccine-related research here at TAG. But, you know, I mean, it, it certainly seems like, you know, referring somebody out for, for PrEP services in that sort of context is probably not going to be viable. Um, but I, I don't think that it means that you, that you don't still offer it. it. It just might mean that, you have to offer it as part of your trial and sort of control, you know, you, you can at least give them their diagnosis, but then they're not seeing if their their antibodies, you know, present. Um, but I, I'm, yeah, that's as far as I would be willing to speculate. And I know some people are on from the HVTN. I don't know if anyone wants to respond as well. This is Wake that unlike you, Mitchell, I can't see who else is on from the HVTN. I don't know. I just I, I, I think there's some hands there. But go ahead, Wakefield. I'd love to hear any thoughts from you. Um, well, who are the hands? 
Well, I, Kahiso, I think, is on. All right. What I, what I want to say, though, is this is an ongoing consideration. We have actually in the last uh, year or so established a, South, a Southern African VISP task force that meets regularly to consider these issues and pays attention to um, what's, on, what's happening both ongoing in trial and how we, how we manage for individuals or how we help individuals manage any discovery around their own HIV seropositivity and, re, and are in the process of continuing to educate providers. One of the challenges, though, is, is not, all, not all sites have the capacity to currently administer ongoing um, medical care as much as they have the capacity to do the research, and we have no guarantee at the end of the study that the site is, that these sites are going to be uh, around for years and years. So the, an important aspect of referring individuals out to other providers is uh, trying to make sure that they are getting the care in a place yep. where that care, there will be continuity of care going forward. Uh, and so it's not the clinical trialist providing the care. But uh, there might be additional aspects of the question I didn't fully understand. Uh, and I think there will be representatives from the MRC. The MRC is sponsoring the consultation next week, but that's also why we do ongoing consultation, because the more trials we conduct, the more we learn, the more scenarios that we haven't anticipated um, come up, and we need to be proactive in responding. Great. Thanks, Wakefield. For those who don't know, that was Steve Wakefield from the HIV Vaccine Trials Network. Can you, so you have your hand raised. Do you want to um, hit star seven? Can you, so star seven. And go ahead. This is Susan Buckbinder. Can you hear me? Oh, Susan. Yes, welcome. Fantastic. Sorry, I've been on mute and trying to get off of mute. Um, I just wanted to mention that um, it, it is critical for the vaccine trial sites. I think that that's an excellent question about um, vaccine-induced seropositivity and not wanting to unblind participants. Um, the sites need to work very closely with local uh, providers of care, and that's true for, for PrEP, but it's also true for pregnancy, it's true for a variety of issues, to be sure that the sites themselves um, can do the HIV testing without unblinding a participant, and then give the infection status to um, the care provider, whether it's for PrEP or pregnancy or whatever else, and that's something that obviously we need to work closely with our participants about, um, we need to work within the community about, and we need to get, uh, you know, permission from the participants to communicate about HIV infection status to those providers. But it, it's a, an even broader issue than just vaccine-induced seropositivity. We don't want people to be unblinded for any of a variety of uh, clinical reasons that they may get testing out in the community. Great. Susan, thank you. And for those who don't know, Susan is one of the leaders of the Vaccine Trials Network and also one of the leaders of um, uh, the trial that Stacy mentioned that's about to start a new vaccine trial. So um, thank you so much. And I think that really highlights something, Stacy, that you raised, and that is that it, this is never just a conversation between the trial site and the cab. And it's uh, Susan's description of just all the other layers and, 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 and individuals and entities that need to be involved in, in those considerations. So um, super, super helpful. I realize we are now um, at the bottom of the hour, but still have um, well over half of our participants, so adherence is unbelievably high. Um, but maybe I'll just pause, and if anyone else wants to hit star seven and, and introduce themselves and ask a question. Yes, can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. Oh, yes. I wanted to, to comment on, uh, in terms of referring site to demonstration site. So what normally happens is that we encourage our sites to identify demonstration sites around them. That's the first thing. And secondly, to communicate with those demonstration sites and explain to them in terms of uh, participants that they have and that they will be referring participants to them. And for any other circumstances, besides even referring participants to demonstration sites, 
if a participant is participating in an AC10 trial and they need the results for any reason, uh, sites are able to provide uh, results for those participants to be able to produce them where they are required. So we are encouraging sites to, dis- to have those conversations so that when participants are referred to those demonstration sites, the, those sites will be aware of where participants are coming from and uh, then they'll be uh, also to, to, to accept the results that they'll be uh, receiving from the site. So it is those conversations that we are uh, encouraging sites to have uh, because amongst sites and stakeholders that are around, uh, stakeholders within communities where sites operate, we encourage them that it's important to have those communications and build relationships because we are, we are in this together. They don't work in, 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 in solos. I hope uh, that answers the, uh, the question that was raised. Hello? Sorry, I was on mute myself. Um, I was just saying how great that was, Kihiso, and you didn't hear me say that, but thank you so much. Um, okay. I realize we've now gone quite, quite over, but again, we, um, I'm so grateful. There was a, a, a question that I, that I don't think we're going to have time for here uh, because it, it, it is a subject of a, of a future webinar we're hoping to do around the interplay of HIV and sexually transmitted infections and, and how that needs to be understood and messaged. And, and, um, uh, but, but that clearly needs to be something that we table for the next call. Um, I do um, want to just quickly give um, Jeremiah, Stacy, and Deborah a chance just for any last thoughts before we, we absolutely conclude. Um, maybe we'll go backwards this time and maybe start with you, Deborah. If you're still there, star seven. I am still here, sorry. I, no um, problem. I have to say I'm, um, I, this is all very helpful background for me. I am attending the um, summit next week in Cape Town about um, PrEP in South Africa, and I think it it will be a, such a good um, opportunity to get together and see if we can figure out how to move forward both for um, participants who are currently at risk for HIV and for trying to find more modalities for prevention. So let's hope that we can have a great conversation next week. Great, Deb. Thank you so much. Stacy. Um, can you hear me? Yes. Sorry, I was on and off mute so I didn't. Um, yeah, no, I mean, I think... I'll just sort of take the take this sort of the the GPP route um, and just say you know I think that this is uh, it's a challenging time but I think it's a really actually it's a it's a really exciting time for for all of the 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 things that all of us talked about but I think especially sort of in this Q and A session kind of thinking about what sort of a detailed level of of scrutiny there needs to be around around this whole issue and again. Um, you know, I think we're in a we're in a place now. I mean, you look at sort of that that the pipeline of trials um, and all of the different you know kind of um, the you know the pipeline of trials as well as the the um, the context of, of prep rollout in a lot of these different countries. Um, so I think we're in a place where we can really kind of learn a lot about how to kind of bring bring the two together. Um, and then also, I think just to kind of, again make the case that this is really a, a very concrete role um, that, that advocates can play in the clinical trials process. Um, and I think to just again to kind of make the point that um, the accountability and that sort of idea of kind of ongoing consultation and ongoing sort of dialogue and engagement is is really important as as all of these trials roll out. Great, Stacy. Thank you so much. And Jeremiah, last thoughts. Yeah, just uh, much of what's already been said. Uh, just many thanks to uh, AVAC for for hosting this conversation today. I think it's been really informative, and I think you know some some real themes have have emerged, including you know as Stacy said, this is just a very complex, ongoing conversation. But what is clear is that it's very important that um, you know a, a diverse and, and meaningfully engaged uh, community constituent in multiple different contexts is essential to help lead this conversation um, and that it's going to be important, um, you know, because these are, these are really serious ethical questions and that have real, um, really intense real-world um, implications for, for uh, 
trial participants in the communities where we do research. So, you know, I uh, was invited to the conversation in Cape Town next week. I'm unable to make it, but I, I you know, look forward to hearing what they talk about and, and really sad that I can't be there for that. Um, but I think it's, you know, it's, it's an exciting time and it's, it's a welcome problem to have. Um, but we just need to make sure that we're really letting um, community, you know, however we, we define that, um, really have a, a, a meaningful leading role in that discussion. Great. Jeremiah, thank you so much. And I do want to let you and everybody know we are planning to do a follow-up webinar um, we, uh, in inviting uh, the Medical Research Council um, uh, and others to present anything coming out of that summit. And back to your point, Deborah, let's hope that it does set us up for success, as you will have seen from Stacy's slide. Um, this is one of the most exciting times in um, HIV prevention in many, many years to see so many um, different prevention modalities being studied simultaneously in the same places. And you can do the math here. Um, tens of thousands of people enrolling um, around the world in a predominant number of, of um, women at risk of HIV infection in a number of trials in East and Southern Africa. So this is one of the most exciting and one of the most challenging times. And I want to thank everybody for sticking with it for um, uh, well over an hour and a half. And, and just to say that, that as complex as it is, I think something, Deb, you said that I think probably is one of the most important themes coming out of this is as complex as all of this is, having Clarity and consistency of message um, is critical, whether that is that PrEP works when you take it, whether that is here are the different approaches to clinical trial design because we're asking different questions in different ways in different kinds of trials, and we need to be sure we have clear, consistent messages there, clear, consistent messages about how we're delivering PrEP, um, how we're making decisions in an ongoing way, how we're monitoring those decisions. And I think back to something you said, Jeremiah, and a point that Jeremy Sugarman has written about this idea of, of, of the reason for rebuttal, that if you're not doing it, the onus is on you to explain and, and uh, um, justify why you're not in a consultative way. So um, uh, bottom line, um, we all have a lot of work to do um, to both expand access to what we know works um, and that we know we need more options. And those two are not contradictory messages. In fact, those are the two fundamental messages that will get us eventually to the end of the epidemic. So I um, just want to thank everybody. There are a number of follow-ups that need to happen. And one other thing I'd be very remiss to to, to, to not say, and that is that um, tomorrow um, uh, at 9 a.m. Eastern, and I'll let you do the math depending on where you are, um, there will be a second webinar with Carl Diefenbach, the Director of the Division of AIDS at the National Institutes of Allergy and Infectious Diseases um, as part of the U.S. National Institutes of Health, who will be um, on a webinar talking about the clinical trial network uh, um, redesign in their funding, which is really important and very relevant to this conversation because as you look at this um, list of trials, um, you can see that so many of them have the acronyms MTN, HVTN, HPTN. Um, uh, there are a few outliers, but um, the NIAID-funded networks clearly are driving uh, much of the research and therefore how they all are consistent and collaborative with message is critical. Um, but I invite everybody to join. Um, Carl will be on at 9 a.m. Eastern tomorrow um, to talk about their thinking and to take comments and questions about the future of the network. So I really hope many of you will um, join us then. Um, the call will be recorded, and I know a few people talked about some difficulty with sound and slides skipping, but it will all be posted shortly on the AVAC website. And really um, want to thank um, Deborah and Stacy and Jeremiah, you and Richard and Tim and the whole team at the Treatment Action Group for um, your work and your partnership. And um, uh, I know that we all have a lot of work to do together going forward. So thanks very much, and um, um, this will be continued. Thank you so much, Mitchell. Thanks. Cheers all. Have a great day. Bye.